Okay, it's noon time. It's time for our third tent talk of our October season, and I want to welcome you all here um, to hear uh, Manny Cruz. Um, I want to tell you first just a little bit about the Salem Ward Foundation, okay? Um, we um, have a, a volunteer board uh, whose mission it is to help everyone remember what the um, lessons were that we learned or should have learned from the Salem Witch Trial Memorial or Salem Witch Trials. Uh, my name is Ellen Brandenburg, and I'm on the board, and I I kind of help put these these talks together. Um, now, we do this in th about three different ways. One way is we give out the Salem Award uh, to somebody who is a champion of, social, of human rights and social justice every year. Um, we also are co-stewards along with PEM of this particular uh, memorial. And we also do some educational programming such as this and other things along the way. Um, and we have co-sponsors of some of these events and people who, um, who help us to accomplish what we have set out to do. And you are part of, the, part of that crowd. A lot of people here I know um, are, are uh, grand supporters of the Salem Award Foundation, and I thank you uh, for that and for being here today to hear Manny. Um, I do want to say thanks to the City of Salem and to the Peabody Essex Museum and to Salem State University, Salem State University here, yeah, and, um, and also all of you who have given so generously to, um, to our cause. So without further ado here, I'd like to introduce um, Jesenia Tejada, who is from Leap for Education, and she's going to introduce Manny. Good afternoon. It is with great pleasure that I get to introduce one of my previous students, Victor Cruz, or Manny as many of us know him as. Manny has been a familiar face at Leap for Education as he started coming to the organization when he was probably in like sixth or seventh grade. So he's been with us forever. Um, he went to the academic learning center where he was getting homework help and then he joined the college success program where that's where I met him. Um, so I met Manny six years ago when I became the program direct coordinator for the college success program um, after he had just graduated high school. So after following and watching the historic 2008 election and learning about the electoral process with his mentor, Linda Saris, who's the executive director at Leap for Education, Manny took an interest in public service and politics. He decided to pursue a degree in political science at Salem State University. He went on to work for the National Park Service, and while at Salem State, he was actively engaged in the Student Government Association and held the prestigious position of treasurer. After his sophomore year, I worked with Manny to help him transfer to Northeastern Un University, where he received a full tuition scholarship. During his time at Northeastern, Manny has gone above and beyond and has completed three co-op experiences. Manny took on a co-op in Attorney General Martha Coakley's office and served as a Lindsay Fellow for the U.S. District Court under the Honorable Chief Judge Pat Patty Cyrus. In 2011, Manny Cruz was appointed to serve as the Essex County representative of the Governor's Statewide Youth Council from 2011 to 2013. He was selected by his peers to serve as its chairman. The Governor's Statewide Youth Council was created by Governor Deval Patrick in 2007 in response to widespread outbreaks of youth violence and to serve as an advisory council on matters affecting the youth of the Commonwealth. The council was appointed a total of 28 young people, two, one female, one male, um, from each of the 14 counties in the Commonwealth, ages 14 through 21. So the Governor's Statewide Youth Council worked with the governor and his staff to address issues relating to health care, youth employment, youth violence, and education. So during his time on the council, Manny led and co-designed a statewide anti-bullying initiative called Blackout Bullying. Manny leveraged his position on the Governor's Statewide Youth Council to build deep and meaningful connections with the Salem Public Schools and other youth-serving organizations like UTech, the Boys and Girls Club, and Leap for Education. 
He has also helped with many other initiatives, especially through LEAP, such as Brothers for Success, which aims to help young men of color break down the barriers and challenges they face in terms of accessing college education. He also um, is helping um, to teach like a leadership workshop for our middle school students. He also got LEAP alumni together to start a scholarship in the name of Linda Saris, who's Mandy's mentor, and again, the executive director at LEAP, in order to honor her countless years of dedication to helping youth, local youth with their educational and career goals. Many will be graduating with a bachelor's in political science with a concentration in public policy and administration, as well as two minors in law and public policy and philosophy. He has a lot going on, very busy guy. After graduation, Manny plans on working in the field before going back to school to get a dual degree in law and either a master's in business administration, public administration, or public policy. He's an outstanding young man that we all need to watch out for because one day he might just become our next president. So welcome, Manny. <laughs> I'm just going to take this off. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to try that again. Good afternoon, everyone. Much better, much better. Uh, just send you thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's been a pleasure to know you over the years. Uh, so I'd first like to begin with the name of my talk, which is One Good Suit. Uh, as you can imagine, the suit that I am wearing is the one good suit that I'm going to be talking about. <laughs> Uh, Jasenia pointed out something that was really interesting, which is my first name, which is Victor. Uh, I don't go by Victor, and I'm going to tell you why. I prefer Manny, which is a diminutive of Emmanuel, uh, the name that my mother gave me. So when most people hear the name Victor Cruz, the first thing that comes to mind, especially if you're from New England, is the Giants wide receiver who caught a couple touchdown passes and led to the Patriots defeat in the Super Bowl. Uh, so that's definitely a good reason for me as a major Patriots fan not to like the name Victor Cruz. <laughs> However, uh, that's not the actual reason why I don't like the name. Um, my story begins with my father. My father's name is Victor Cruz. Uh, his father before him was named Victor Cruz, and he named all three of his sons Victor Cruz. The ego on this guy. <laughs> uh, but you see, my father begins by breaking my heart by tearing apart my family. Um, I grew up in a home that was riddled with domestic violence. Uh, my father was an alcoholic, and he was abusive towards my mother. Uh, and fortunately, my mother was able to get away from my father and to raise her three boys on her own. Now, growing up without my father uh, led me to be angry. I had a lot of questions about his absence in my life, and that manifested in my early education. Kindergarten, first grade, second grade, uh, I would always start off the same exact way. The teacher would call roll call, and she would say, is Victor Cruz present? And I would always have a temper tantrum. And she didn't really understand why that was happening. Uh, and I would just scream, you need to call me Manuel because that's what my mother calls me. I don't like that name. And unfortunately for my mother, uh, she ended up in another abusive relationship with my stepfather. And he began to abuse us, myself and my two brothers. And so going throughout the educational system, I never had a voice, and I never had a voice at the home. So every single day that I went to class, it was a struggle for me to stay focused because all I could think about what was, was what was going on at home. I feared for my life and that of my brothers and my mother. So when my teacher would ask me why I didn't turn in my homework, I couldn't tell her. All I could tell my teachers was that I don't care about school. I come here to have fun, and that's it. And eventually, the conflict with my stepfather would grow to the point where I decided that in sixth grade, I was going to commit suicide. I was a student at Collins Middle School. Uh, I was in in-house suspension when I wrote my first suicide note. And I was really set on doing this. But really what it was was a cry for help. And fortunately, uh, a student had picked up the note that I left in the barrel and had turned it into the principal at the time, Mary Manning. And the next day I was called into the office and she was able to intervene. Um, and from there I was hospitalized for about four days and I felt great in that hospital. I felt safe for the first time in a long time because I didn't have to worry about my stepfather. 
but he would visit with my mother and my brothers, and I knew that we weren't actually safe. That if I didn't go back home, something could happen to them, especially if I spoke out about what was actually going on at home. See, the thing with kids that live in traumatic homes is that they know what the consequences are of telling someone what's going on. The family will most likely be broken up. Maybe that individual will be removed from the house, or things could just get worse. And that was my biggest fear. So I ended up returning home, and for the next few months, there was nothing but contention between myself and my stepfather. Things got violent. One day, I approached my mother and I told her exactly what was going on when she would leave and go to work. That he would abuse us, that he would do things like lock us in the basement when he didn't want to hear from us anymore. And my mother decided to confront my stepfather. And he decided that he was going to kill her. And I remember seeing him choking her on the staircase, thinking to myself that my mother's going to die and, and that it's all because of me. So I picked up the phone and I threatened my stepfather. I said, I'm going to call the police. And he came after me, started choking me instead. He was hell-bent on killing me. And fortunately, my mother regained her strength and was able to get him off of me. And he fled the house. And then after that, decided that he could no longer stay with us until things had cooled down between himself and, my, and myself. And he went to the Dominican Republic. Unfortunately, my stepfather never returned, but the trauma of living in a household filled with violence stayed with me. And it was around that summertime that I actually engaged with Leap for Education for the first time. Uh, a couple of my friends had approached me to tell me that there was this cool place that we could go and use computers and play games. And when my stepfather was around, we were never allowed to leave the house. As soon as we got home from school, this is where we were to remain um, under his watchful eye. Uh, and I was so excited about the opportunity to go to LEAP. And as soon as I walked in there, I was engaged by a woman named Linda Saris. And Linda, the first thing I believe she asked me was, um, so do you have any homework? Uh, to which I responded, no. Um, but I would really love to use some computers. So I signed up for the program. And the thing that Linda would quickly learn about me, uh, although my stepfather would never return to the United States, was that every single time that I would come for after school help, that there was going to be an episode, that I would continuously be angry and disrupt programming because I just couldn't deal with the trauma that I had experienced. And that continued for a very long time. And when, when things finally got better is when Linda started bringing in different mentors to our programs, like Marshall Bradstreet, um, a man that has worked with countless boys and girls clubs and youth serving organizations, um, some different male role models. Uh, I remember a volunteer named Manny uh, who kind of took me under his wing. Uh, and male role models for me were few and far between. So when they did come, I used to latch on to them uh, like glue. And when I got to high school, I never really had thoughts about my education. Uh, I didn't think that I was ever going to go to college. My mother's education stopped in the sixth grade. And for me, um, I was set on dropping out at 16. And it was around sophomore year of high school when my anger would get the best of me. Uh, I was being disruptive in class. And my teacher had called me out. And I decided that this is intolerable. Uh, so I started yelling at her, and she kicked me out, and I went to the office, and I was supposed to be taking a quiz that day, but that didn't happen. So she said, if you want to take the quiz, you need to come after school so that we can talk. And me being a 16-year-old, arrogant as most 16-year-olds are, I thought, okay, great. I'm going to be free here, and I can go take this quiz, and everything's going to be just fine. But what I didn't know was that that teacher was going to tell me exactly what I needed to be told, which was that I had no right to disrupt the learning environment, that I was a bully, and that I needed to change my actions, and that she was not going to allow me to take that test. She stood up to me. Uh, and I responded by being angry. I was little Manny again. I picked up two chemistry tables, uh, I slammed them to the ground, and I walked out. Now, I can't remember all the details, but what I do know is that I scared that teacher. Um, she went and she told the dean at the time, Mr. Chevry, 
and he called my house to tell me that I would be suspended for 10 days. Uh, a police officer that we are sorely going to miss, uh, Officer Fecta, who's the community um, police officer. He works with a uh, school resource officer. Uh, he works closely with the Salem Public Schools. He came to visit my house, and he really wanted to know uh, my side of the story. And Officer Fecta and I had a very long talk about myself and my image, um, and he was willing to give me a second chance because the school was ready to press assault charges against me for what I had done. Um, and I worked with Officer Fecto to write an apology letter, and he was really my advocate to the public schools, and I was able to come back. But when you do something like that, the first thing that you need to think about is your image and how you're going to change. And for me, I had no plan whatsoever. Uh, but fortunately, it was around that same time that I would meet another mentor named Andre Daly, who was then the teen director of the Boys and Girls Cl Club of Greater Salem. And Andre was instrumental in changing my life because he was always present and he was that male role model that I was seeking to replace my father. And so Andre, what he did was he took me under his wing uh, and he used the game of basketball to teach me life lessons. See, I had never met a man of color that had gone to college. And Andre, he went to Rhode Island College, he went to RCC, um, and he had so many different life experiences. And we would just swap stories. Uh, he would talk to me about his morals, his values, how he came to understand them, um, and how he changed his own life. And that really inspired me to want to be better, uh, and it really started to culminate with a leadership role on the basketball team. Andre decided that he wanted to make me his captain. And when I tell you that I'm not very good at basketball, if you go to Salem Access Television, you can watch a short video of me breaking both my wrists this past summer uh, <laughs> playing basketball. Uh, but Andre saw something in me in that it was that my peers gravitated towards me. And he told me that I had a responsibility, not just to myself, but to my community, to use, to use my voice, to use my story, to use the skills that I was acquiring them, and to mentor others, and to speak up to adults about some of the issues that we were facing. And he also told me, Manny, if you want to go somewhere in life, education is the key moving forward. Uh, but when we're having this conversation, I have a 2.3 GPA. Uh, as Jesenia will gladly tell any college success student, you need a 3.0 to qualify for most scholarships. Um, and my dream was to go to Northeastern University. Andre had taken me on a trip there, and I said, this place is awesome. They have grass. I want to go where there's grass. Um, but I knew that Northeastern was out of reach. In order to get into Northeastern University, you needed about a 2,000 on your SAT scores, and you needed a 3.7 GPA. Uh, and Jasenia and I, we did the math, and there was just no way it was going to happen. Um, but Andre's own story of transferring from RCC to Rhode Island College and then having an opportunity to play at Brown if he desired it and then Jasenia telling me that there was a path forward if I did well at, at a different school like North Shore Community College or Salem State that Northeastern or Suffolk or BU even Harvard was within my reach set a fire in my belly and I said okay I think I can do this. Now Jasenia had mentioned earlier that Linda Saris is my mentor and that she inspired me uh, because we were walking uh, watching the 2008 elections and that's what got me into politics and public service and that story is so integral because a lot of young people when we're going through the education system we're not really thinking about what our college majors are going to be and we don't really have an understanding of the real world and how it works so for Linda to sit there with me while I'm starting to turn on my mind to her and being interested in college and to have a conversation about the electoral process and say well these are the types of things that you could do if you were a political science major it connected the educational concepts to something practical for me um, and that was really eye-opening because I could see that I was incredibly passionate about politics and public service so why not try this out um, so by the end of senior year, I was taking a comparative politics class, and I got a 98 in it. Uh, I ended senior year with a 3.6 GPA, uh, and I was setting myself up for success in college. And the thing that I learned throughout high school was that you need to engage in different after-school programs because the people that are there are going to become your social capital, and they will open and show you doors. And so one of the things that was really important for me was the college tours that I took with Jasenia, the conversations that I had with her, the conversations with Andre, and the different places that they would take me. And they also said that, Manny, if you really want to be a leader, you need to try this out. 
you need to, if you're interested in student government, take a chance. You didn't do it in high school, but you can do it in college. You get a fresh start. You start college with a 4.0 GPA. When I first heard that, I was so excited. I was so excited. I actually get a fresh start. I can be proud of who I am in college. I, I, I could get a 3.6. I could get to Northeastern. And then the opportunity came to, to join the Governor's Statewide Youth Council, and that required an adult sponsor. And I went straight to Linda, and she just said, okay, Manny, I don't know what this entails. It sounds like I'm going to have to do a lot of driving all around the state, but I'm in. I'm in. Because it was something that I wanted to do. So where does one good suit fit into all this? So when I got suspended for 10 days, my mother came up to me, um, and she said, I'm going to get you a suit. And so I'm thinking that this suit must be for my court date. Uh, but in fact, my mom, she looked me dead in the eye and she said, Manny, I'm going to get you this suit and you're going to do great things with it. Uh, and so this suit here, I've worn it throughout my entire journey. So when I got my first job through Leap for Education, I was working as a coder on um, a project and I was doing graphic design. This is what I wore to the, to the interview with my client. Uh, this is what I wore when I gave a speech at Collins Middle School, uh, when I was sworn into the Governor's Statewide Youth Council. And the suit itself just represents the journey, the process. Um, so for me, one of the things that I've always tried to do is to give back because that's what's been instilled in me. So in today's world, we live in an increasingly globalizing world. Things are getting faster. And when we think about our young people, um, they're growing up in the digital age in which they're dealing with two distinct um, worlds. One is the physical world, the real world, where you have to interact with people, you have to gain skills. Um, and then there's the digital world of social media and all the different things that are out there. And for me, connecting with our kids has been a little bit easier, but I do see needs. Uh, so I started this project, um, and I named it after the suit, One Good Suit, in which I started doing research into at-risk youth, the achievement gap, and then also extended learning days within the schools, because I was super interested in trying to create spaces for mentors to come in and work with kids, because for me, it seems like the difference in my story was that I had people that kept reaching out and that they didn't stop caring about my own interests. They had invested in me. They humanized me. They, they, they led me to different networking events. Um, they give me different opportunities. And it was those things that were able to keep me engaged throughout my education, but then also in my own community. And so now, I've been working with uh, Collins Middle School and Bowdage um, to teach leadership and character development courses. And I've been working with a lot of young people. And the thing that resonates the most with them about my story is the practical experiences that I've had. So I had the pleasure of going to Northeastern University where we have the prestigious co-op program where you get to go for six months and work in the field. Um, and so I did one co-op at the Attorney General's office. I was there during the Boston Marathon bombing. I got to see government in action. Uh, I got to see collaboration between community organizations. I got to see um, Attorney General Martha Coakley work tirelessly to make sure that the victims of the Boston Marathon bombing uh, received due compensation um, and that justice was served. Uh, I also worked at an institution called the Institute for Healthcare Improvement that works on improving um, health worldwide. Um, they work on different projects in Africa and Latin America. Um, and those two co-ops were also instrumental for me. And I think the thing that I had learned from Linda, from, from Jesenia, from, from Andre was opportunity identification and how to build those relationships with adults. Uh, when I was on co-op, uh, I would always go to my co-op supervisor and ask different questions um, about the different roles within the agencies. Um, and then at the same time, when I was um, coming back to campus, I was going to my professors and I was trying to link the concepts that I was learning in class with what I had been doing with data at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. So the thing that I see as the missing piece is apprenticeship within the public schools, linking kids to to job opportunities and internship programs. Uh, the thing that I just don't understand is why we haven't taken a model like Northeastern's co-op model and brought it to our public schools because it's going to give an opportunity for our kids um, to immerse themselves with, 
within a, an actual professional setting, but then also um, to build connections that'll lead to different doors once they graduate from college. Uh, my generation is growing up in one of the worst economic um, times. There's a lot of bleakness, there's the student loan crisis, um, and the job market is just simply not ready for us. And it's something that when I talk to my peers that didn't go to Northeastern, they say to themselves, you know, I spent four years in college as a professional student, and now they're telling me that I need experience to get a job, but I had to go to school in order to have the degree that the job also requires, so how am I supposed to get that experience? Um, and so this is the opportunity that I've identified that we need to start thinking about our, our public schools, about our, our universities, and, and trying to transform them into something that leads to pro better professional outcomes for our students. Um, so I see that Dr. Brendan Walsh is here, uh, who is a school committee member of Salem. And Dr. Brendan Walsh and I have always had this conversation about immersion, right? We have a lot of students in our own community of Salem that they're, they're immigrating here. Um, some of them are first generation, second generation, and we talk about how do you integrate them into our American culture. Um, I can't think of a better way than building connections between people. That human capital will follow them wherever it is that they go. Um, and in terms of my aspirations for public service, I have to really say that it, it begins with the conversations that I've had with hardworking Americans while I was at the National Park Service that would tell me about the different issues that they faced. Um, they would come here to learn about the witch trials and I I would try to find out a little bit more about them and their lives. Um, so I'm a curious person, naturally, um, and I think that something that would benefit my own generation is to ask a little bit more questions. Uh, I'm, I'm specifically interested in social entrepreneurship. Um, I, I'm, I've been studying under the tutelage of Sarah Menard, um, who is a professor at Columbia University that's now at Northeastern, and she's been working with me to try to build um, out some type of network and that really inspired me to create Empower which um, is where I started the uh, Linda Sarah Scholarship Fund. So I, I'm trying to find different ways to get our alumni, our young people, our professionals together so that we can start collaborating to create our own vision for the world which is one in which students of all races, creeds um, have the equal opportunity to succeed in this great country. Thank you. And uh, now I will be taking any questions. Uh, so I believe we have time for about five or so. Or comments. So your home story was Salem Bay. Yes, uh, so Salem is my hometown. Um, I did grow up in Lynn for a short while, but we don't acknowledge those times. <laughs> I am a witch, thorough. Um, I, I was born and raised in Salem. I love this place. Uh, learning about the history, I feel very connected to Elias Haskett Derby, who was America's first millionaire, uh, had an estimated net worth of $33 billion. I'm trying to resurrect Salem's greatness. <laughs> yes. Yes, of course. Um, so in response to um, outbreaks of youth violence. Uh, Governor Deval Patrick started the statewide youth council um, and in 2008 seated the first youth council and they worked specifically on passing legislation. Um, so they, they advocated for the most comprehensive anti-bullying law in the country um, and then by the time my council had been sworn in we had begun to um, carry on their work. So blackout bullying began as a conversation about the data that existed about bullying, how underreported it was, um, the struggles that some of the kids were having, and so we decided that we wanted to put on an awareness campaign to talk about bullying um, because a lot of the kids simply just don't know how to deal with conflict, they don't understand what bullying it is, uh, so we decided to base it really off of um, a program called Rachel's Challenge, which um, if you're familiar with Columbine, I believe there was a girl named Rachel uh, who had <clears throat> tragically passed away. Um, and she, they're running this program, Rachel's Challenge, in different parts of Massachusetts that request them. So we decided that we wanted to do something similar in which we would bring in different public service public servants to talk about the issues of bullying, but then also have youth council representatives um, speak about the issue as well. And then 
encourage the kids to take ownership in the issue itself. Um, so we held different rallies throughout, I believe, 70 different schools. Um, and then we also uh, went to the state house and advocated to different um, legislators as well. You're welcome. Dr. Ben Walsh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. That was Thank great. That was great. That was great. Okay, one more round of applause for um, Manny Cruz. He deserves it, everyone. Thank you, and thank you all for being here, and I hope that you'll come back next week and hear Kate Fox talk about misconceptions of the Salem witch trials. Thank you.